I, I do appreciate being um, placed in the time slot where I can say good afternoon, everyone, because now we were all in the afternoon time, time zones. So I was asked to provide an overview for the Eastern Plant Board um, regarding spotted lanternfly and some of the things that um, activities we've been doing and things that we're seeing. So next slide, please. Um, as you can see, the states are, are uh, staying very busy with lots of activities regarding outreach to citizens, uh, treatments that are going on. We do have a lot of counties that have been quarantined, but we also have um, several treatments. Um, Delaware, over 2,700 trees have tr been treated uh, so far this season with insecticides. Um, uh, Connecticut is working very closely with USDA on treatment. Uh, New Hampshire and Maine have had some incidents where spotted lanternfly egg masses were moved to their states um, with egg masses. Uh, Maine is reporting that they've not found any spotted lanternfly since that event, uh, but they continue to survey. And New Hampshire has actually um, worked very well with their industry and they have um, one of their um, leading nurseries that are taking this extremely seriously and they have perfected uh, inspection methods as they are receiving materials uh, from other states and they have got it down to a science where they are inspecting, scraping these egg masses and then providing them to New Hampshire who, who is actually uh, then uh, hatching them. So uh, that has been very successful uh, in keep in uh, letting New Hampshire know well, how they're coming in. There have been five out-of-state nurseries that have shipped um, infested nursery stock, uh, and they are from multiple states. They are not just from one. Um, but again, it helps New Hampshire as they're monitoring and know where to survey. Next slide, please. So New Jersey, uh, currently um, 873,000 acres are in their quarantine over the winter, which is a massive undertaking uh, to do egg mass um, destruction. They've destroyed over 61,000 egg masses. And when you consider that there's 30 to 50 viable eggs, uh, that's, that's a considerable knockdown. So kudos to them for their efforts as they've been doing that. New York did a tree removal and chipping of host trees in Ithaca, New York, um, and they have seen results of reduction of population. And this was actually um, a good win for them because it was done at no cost to the state. Uh, they had a utility company that actually completed this work. Uh, so that's a good indication for states. Make sure that you're reaching out to various industries uh, you might be surprised at some of the new friendships you find and um, build as you're trying to um, eradicate or work on spotted lantern fly. They are also currently working to have other agencies within their state be able to treat spotted lantern fly on their own properties, and they have certain processes that they are going through. They are seeing significant increases uh, in reports from Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, so they are, are taking care and following up on those reports. For Pennsylvania, we have begun our rail treatments uh, this year. We've treated a couple of, couple of the rail properties and are continuing to work with Norfolk Southern on um, accessing properties for survey and treatment. And we will continue um, for <clears throat> high pathways properties we have since July treated over 6,800 trees and our compliance and enforcement uh, teams are currently conducting roadside inspections. They're also doing something new this year where we are um, going into counties, uh, selecting one county a week and the entire team goes there. Uh, they may work very closely with Penn, um, Pennsylvania State Police to set up a roadside inspection. Again, we're kind of broadening uh, how we work with state police um, in doing those roadside inspections, but it's also an opportunity to reach out to businesses 
uh, who are not permitted. It also is allowing us to do audits uh, of businesses that do have permits um, and allowing us to see that they are actually uh, providing the training and um, maintaining the paperwork that's required by our quarantine. Uh, so we we are looking forward to um, continuing with that, and they've already selected their next um, county for next month. Uh, West Virginia, they currently have three counties with known populations, and they are not considering a quarantine at this time. Next slide, please. And really to help you better understand how uh, this all looks on a map, and I do appreciate um, Jay works for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and in addition to a wonderful facilitator, he's great at maps. So Jay, thank you very much for your assistance in putting this map together. Uh, the counties you see in blue are quarantined. Um, the counties that you see in purple are known infestations, but currently not quarantined. Um, so you can see that it is widespread, but even like within Pennsylvania, you'll notice some of the blue is light blue versus dark blue in those counties. Um, so those populations are uh, quite contained. Um, we only have one or two municipalities in some of the newer counties that we called last year. And we have been um, treating and we are finding uh, that the numbers are coming down significantly there. And we will continue to to attack those pretty aggressively. Next slide. Some of the common concerns that Eastern Plant Board states have, uh, we're having a difficult time with hiring and keeping staff. Uh, we also are, uh, for some states, finding difficulties in fielding reports. Um, when the adults are very, when they're out, you know, which is right now, and active, uh, you'll get a lot of reports coming in from citizens wondering what do I do, um, who should I tell, um, who can help me, especially when they get into the moments where they might be doing um, landing on you, which will come late, a little bit later in the season. Um, so, you know, we need some assistance there. Social media reports, trying to decipher what's real, what was actually seen, where was it actually seen, um, as we've all heard, uh, from a couple of presentations, social media presents um, new things that we have to consider as we are moving forward. And then, of course, we are trying to regulate uh, industries that are not traditionally ag-oriented. Uh, so teaching them what we do and why we do it um, has also been a challenge. Next slide. So sharing the message, um, lots of creative ways the states are working to get messaging out through newsletters, through different industries, Facebook, um, handouts, billboards. Billboards are uh, one thing that have um, taken off um, and it is a matter of trying to find the right price with the people who you are working with. Some deals are better than others, but I know Virginia also has had some success with that. Um, but we also had to be very careful as we were thinking about money last year for COVID um, because people weren't going anywhere. Uh, so, you know, flexing and the midst of COVID um, was another big aspect of how do you handle it and how do you move forward? Okay, next slide. And that, again, is just a high view oversight of what is going on in the Eastern Plant Board. And I think Vicki is next on uh, Pennsylvania or uh, Eastern Plant Board pest concerns. Thank you, Dana. Um, I need to be able to share my screen. Am I going to be able to do that? Yep. Yeah, you are a co-host. Vicki, go ahead and uh, you should be able to have that share screen option at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Let me get my 
is that? Okay, I'm having trouble here. Um, not getting it. Okay. Yeah, we're seeing your your Zoom screen. Yeah, uh, I know. That's not what I want. So, okay. At the top of your okay. screen, there's an option uh, near View Options. You can select Stop Share, um, and then when you click on Share Screen again, uh, try and select the one that has your your presentation on it. That's. That's there what we're go. doing. There we go. Okay. Yep. You All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. I'm Vicki Smith at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. We've had some discussion in the Eastern Plant Board concerning beech leaf disease. This is a uh, fairly uh, new disease for the Eastern Plant Board, at least. I know the folks in Ohio have been dealing with it for a while but it seems to be the neglected child of uh, diseases to come along. And Gary Fish and I have worked together and put together a uh, little presentation as to why we think it matters. Beech leaf disease was confirmed in Connecticut in 2019. And since that moment, it's been going like, well, I said the other day in our meeting, I said it's been going like a, uh, Oregon wildfire. We have found it since then in all counties of Connecticut, as well as in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Gary has found it in Maine. Um, the affected areas are rapidly growing and the number of affected areas is increasing. Um, American beech is not very significant as a timber species, but it is a very important mask species. Basically everything from mice to moose utilize beech nuts as a food source. Has any of you ever eaten a beech nut? Probably not because the animals get to them as soon as they fall to the ground. You'll probably never find one. In addition, uh, beeches are mycorrhizal with a number of species of mushrooms that are used as a food source by um, invertebrates and small animals. Um, beach, American beach can stabilize erosion prone soils by sending up lots and lots of root sprouts. Given that the seeds are so rapidly eaten, the tree reproduces primarily by these root sprouts and they can stabilize erosion prone areas. American beech is not a major nursery crop, at least for the Connecticut nurserymen, but European beech certainly is. Beech leaf disease has been shown to move in the nursery trade. Um, we actually found uh, beech leaf disease on some nursery stock from another state earlier this year. We don't know the level of susceptibility of European beech to beech leaf disease. So there's just a lot of questions there concerning um, uh, beech leaf disease in the nursery industry. Uh, American beaches, at least in most of the East Coast, is already under assault by beech leaf, uh, beech bark disease, which is a complex of an aphid and a fungus. So American beaches are already uh, it's sort of in trouble from beech bark disease, and now we have beech leaf disease to worry about as well. One thing that really bothers me is that there's really no management guidelines for beech leaf disease for land managers, nursery producers, or for homeowners. I really just hate it when someone calls me, describes what they're seeing on their beaches, and I have to tell them, well, that's just too bad. Your trees are probably going to die. I don't think that's a very good answer, but I, that's the only answer I have. We are already documenting tree decline and probable tree death due to beech leaf disease. We just completed our annual aerial survey of the forested areas in the state. And we found several areas where um, there was considerable canopy decline, um, canopy uh, disappearance, lots of discoloration, and we ground truth those to be beech leaf disease. So we're already seeing a uh, considerable tree decline due to beech leaf disease. Just a quick map here I'll show to you. This is uh, from my colleague at the experiment station, Bob Mara. He's doing research on beech leaf disease. 
um, the um, the uh, uh, red uh, crosses are where he has found uh, beech leaf disease positives. Our first find was in Lower Fairfield County at a private residence. We've since found it in in every county of the state. Bob has set up some long-term uh, survey uh, sites in uh, in each county. And like I said earlier, we found this disease in. Uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Gary Fish has reported finding it in Maine. So uh, the issue that we have here is it's kind of a neglected child. Uh, we have been uh, having difficulty in really getting anyone to pay a lot of attention to this. I think it's going to increase in importance in the next few years. It's coming as quite a blow to us as well because uh, we've basically lost all of the ashes in southern New England from emerald ash borer, and now we're just afraid that we stand to lose all of the American beaches in the forest due to beech leaf disease. So we just kind of wanted to bring this to your attention um, as, as sort of the up and coming um, forest disease that uh, we're looking at. That's all the slides that I have. Um, so if you have any questions, I will try to address them. Thank you. Vicki, we did have one question from uh, David in Virginia. Uh, what level of decline or defoliation are you seeing in Connecticut? Um, well, decline, we are, we are seeing, um, I would say less than 10% of the mature trees are declining. However, we're finding beech leaf disease in all size classes of trees from trees that are, oh, sometimes 20 inch DBH all the way down to sprouts. And that is really serious when you find a disease in the understory sprouts, because that's the next generation of trees. And these trees are severely affected by beech leaf disease in many cases. What has been very interesting in that we found the disease in 2019 and it really exploded in 2020 all across the state. And my question is, is why did that happen? We have no idea. And I'm seeing that uh, other people have commented that they found beech leaf disease in uh, New York State and it has also been reported in Pennsylvania. And I really appreciate that information. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. And I see Gary Fish has got some figures up there too, where he's found beech leaf disease. Um, Anthony, do we have a sense of how this disease spreads? That is the $100,000 question. Uh, we really don't know. One of the ideas that I had was last year we had a very strong wind event in the form of Hurricane uh, or Tropical Storm Isaias. It blew through the state with winds of 80 miles an hour and above. Um, and I and I looked at the storm uh, track of Isaias and the occurrence of beech leaf disease, and there really was no relationship. Uh, Isaias cut a fairly narrow swath through the state, but beech leaf disease was fricking everywhere. Um, are there other host species? Again, um, what's been documented is American beech and European beech. Uh, other than that, I really don't know. Um, this is Faith Campbell. There's been a lot of work on beech leaf disease in the forest health community. Um, if you Google it, you can easily find the links to the experts in uh, the Cleveland area, the Cleveland Parks area who just discovered it and have done a lot of the work. But forest health protection and to some extent forest uh, US Forest Service research are doing work on it. Um, they don't they're not 100% sure what the causal agent is. The nematode looks most suspicious, but there are questions. And it has certainly spread very rapidly from Cleveland East to the Atlantic. And it's widespread in uh, Pennsylvania and New York and probably working its way down. Yeah, thank you. My colleague, Bob Mara, has been in touch with the uh, working groups with the Forest Service, however, try as we might, we have had a lot of difficulty getting funding to do research on beech leaf disease. 
Bob is looking at some of the DNA markers in the nematode that's been associated. Um, I, I have heard, and I can't remember who it is, somebody else is working on some of the microbiome associated with the nematode as well to try to find some kind of link as to um, the mechanism for pathogenesis in this disease. And I see yeah, David, and, and David just, yeah. yeah, David and Virginia just chimed in. So this is really interesting uh, of all the different po people that are chiming in positives. It's also in West Virginia, or at least uh, they found the nematode there. Will I put in uh, my part now or? <laughs> yep, go ahead, Gary. Well, in, in Maine, uh, you know, we hadn't seen it at all in 2020 and then 2021, all of a sudden we had a report from a couple that watched their beach stand quite closely. And when our pathologist uh, from the Forest Service went out to look, it was obviously beach reef disease and confirmed later on. and. Since then, we found it up and down our mid coast, uh, pretty widespread, and you know a lot of, a lot of damage, a lot of defoliation, and also in older trees. And we have the similar concern about the beach bark disease and and what that might uh, entail, with the combination of both, and whether that will cause us to have a lot more mortality than maybe they're getting in some other areas. And I will then go into my my other part here and I get this to work. So hopefully you'll see the slideshow and not something else. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about brown tail moth. Uh, probably not many of you have heard of this insect before. It's definitely not my favorite caterpillar. And you can see the tenacity of some here as to trying to uh, manage this pest because it's, it's a really a, a, a pest. And it originally came from Europe and probably introduced on plants that uh, came in from Europe in Somerville, Mass. And it was near a railroad and took off from there. And it is related to Lymantria dispar, which we don't call that other name anymore. And it has a very wide host range. It especially likes oaks, but birch, cherry, elm, poplar, especially loves apples, crab apples, other hardwoods, roses. It's, it's pretty uh, widespread and, and it is quite voracious especially this year. And the biggest deal of all with this is the risk to humans. And it has these very microscopic, microscopic verticaceous hairs, which cause rashes, as you see here, which are actually probably worse than poison ivy and last much longer, uh, sometimes for weeks and even longer. And you know, many people have to be treated with uh, prednisone or other uh, drugs to try to get the uh, the rashes to subside. It's a pretty nasty thing. And there is a, a fairly long history in, in New England uh, for this pest. And you can see here where they used to have a bounty on uh, collecting the overwintering nests that are in the tops of trees or on the, the ends of uh, branches for smaller plants. And you can see them uh, here trying to get them in the orchard. It was a major orchard pest. And I'm not sure exactly what they paid, but uh, we, we've heard as much as five cents for a hundred nests or something like that back in the 1920s. That was quite a bit. And the population has uh, expanded and retreated over the years. Uh, in the 19 uh, teens, it was all the way out into the Maritimes and all the way over into Vermont and down into Connecticut and even onto Long Island. And it then contracted over the years. And up until uh, probably about 19, 
88 or 89, it had been pushed off onto just a single island off the Casco Bay, House Island. And then uh, it was deregulated and they stopped trying to clip the uh, webs. And ever since then, it's been moving back onto mainland and, and kind of taking over. And this, this map, I guess, shows even better the uh, maximum extent and initial introduction was down here and it, it just moved uh, very quickly, uh, especially into orchards. And, you know, currently uh, we are seeing all kinds of things with this particular insect. There's been a, a massive expansion in it. And uh, you can see here from uh, 2019 uh, to 2020, or, um, you know, actually the 2018 to 2020, uh, how much it expanded. Uh, there's you know alerts that went up up and down the whole coast, and then in 2021 it moved even further inland into Maine, and all, it's in every single county in Maine now, even uh, up you know very far up north, and many more acres now than 153,000. I don't think there's a, a number yet for for 2021. One of the issues that uh, we confront right now is that the moths that were out. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, are very attracted to lights. And we had some garden centers, especially some big box stores that had a lot of lights around where they have their displays of plants. And you can see here plants that are just covered with moths. Most, most of these are uh, males at least, but some of them are females and we did find them laying eggs, uh, especially on some of the fruit trees that were in display areas. A lot of these uh, stores actually had in their landscapes, uh, a number of fruit trees that were infested, and therefore, you know, there was they're ripe for uh, getting this uh, sudden infestation of moths. In the winter is the, the strategic time to try to control them. Uh, they overwinter up in the very tops of the trees in very tight nests, and you can clip those nests and, and kind of nip it in the bud that way, but. It takes a you know a skilled arborist to be able to to get these with a, a lift or climbing, and it makes it a lot more difficult to control. Especially you can't really do that in forested areas, and uh, there's a lot of pressure right now politically to do something about this pest. It's it's been kind of left up to our towns to to take care of, and there's even a commercial out now that's against one of our. Uh, representatives in Congress saying that you know he dropped the ball on this and it's you know it's that big of a deal. And each one of those nests will have up to maybe three or four hundred individual caterpillars in them. You can see here one that's been clipped out and uh, the caterpillars have come out. And you know as far as managing it, it, it is a, a you know kind of complicated. You can do the winter webs. You can survey for those those. Um, tight webs, especially when it's a kind of a, a bright winter day, maybe with a little bit of clouds, and you can see that they actually shine like a, those uh, jewels up in the top of the tree. Unfortunately, those aren't very nice jewels. And basically, the, the real difficulty is is that you have to treat very early, and there's really no foliage there to apply to. So there's a lot of injection treatments that are done, and you know above and beyond that personal protection measures are really required. Uh, I think probably all of our staff has had the rash this year and it's not, not any fun. And uh, you know, it's something that we hope is not going to continue to move into other areas. Uh, it's funny that it kind of hasn't been in New Hampshire. You kind of go across the border and you don't see it, but it is in, uh, New in Massachusetts. It's out on Cape Cod. And they have started to find uh, some populations inland as well. And uh, you know, I don't know if Karen can talk about that later, but it, uh, it's definitely a pest that we wish had never been deregulated because maybe it could have been eradicated. And I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, thank you, Gary. I don't see any questions for you just yet. Um, so we're going to switch over to Chris Logue from New York. Uh, Chris, if you're ready to go. Sure. Thanks, Jay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I do not have slides prepared. I figure you probably have seen plenty of slides here over the last couple of days. And 
frankly, my topic is uh, is perhaps not quite as as developed as as some of the others that you've heard from my colleagues here in the Eastern Plant Board. But I wanted to talk a little bit today about um, some sort of data analysis that we've been doing a little bit here in New York uh, regarding uh, agricultural pest introductions over, say, the past 30 years or so. Um, and uh, here in New York, and, and, you know, kind of the preliminary things that we find about these introductions are things that perhaps are not all that surprising. Um, of, of the 30 or so pests in the last 30 years, uh, about half of them uh, showed up in counties uh, in metropolitan New York City area, Long Island, out through there, and then the other half uh, in western New York. And so um, when you think about that, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, New York City, a lot of international travel, a lot of international business. And then when you look at uh, the western New York counties, you have um, an international border there uh, with Canada that's uh, about 450 miles in, in length. Um, just make note, the international border with Canada across uh, the whole country is over 5,000 miles in length. And also uh, Canada is our largest uh, trading partner. Um, we've got four of the busiest uh, border crossings into Canada um, in, in the country here in New York State. So I don't think, you know, sort of that initial analysis is anything, anything that surprises us. We know that with trade, you're going to have um, introductions and, and sort of, if you will, cross-pollination back and forth among nations. And so we certainly expect that. And I would say, you know, in particular, the, the plant pathways, the traditional pathways we work in, I think we do a pretty good job of uh, keeping track of these things, but perhaps some of the other pathways um, need a little bit more attention. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit more specifically about Western New York. Um, and again, as we were just very early into the process of looking at, at these different things that have happened over the years, but you know, clearly some of these are things that probably came in through trade um, or could have come in through uh, smuggling uh, types of things. And others, uh, frankly, appear to be uh, natural spread into New York. And um, that's really kind of the area that has interested me in the last couple of years with um, plum pox virus and, and European cherry fruit fly. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll say that with plum pox, I think the initial introduction into New York was probably through plant material and human assisted, but we do have a risk of reintroduction uh, through aphid transmission that some models predict happens very soon. But kind of where I wanted to go a little bit with this today is just to kind of throw out there um, that uh, when you have natural spread back and forth across an international border um, and you have perhaps policies that conflict in the two countries as far as how these things are, are addressed, um, that can create, uh, create some challenges for the regulatory agencies as well as some challenges for um, the ag industry. And in particular, in our Niagara region in New York, we you know, continue to see that. That's where we've had plum pox virus. Uh, that's where we've had uh, European cherry fruit fly. And it's, you know, on the Canadian side where um, the box tree moth is. And so very, very concerned about uh, the continued um, conversations with Canada, how we work better together. And I'm not not here to, to judge, um, you know, what approach is better, uh, the approach on, on the Canadian side or the approach on the, on the US side of the border. Um, but what I can comment on is, is that these introductions are costing uh, everybody quite a lot of money and time um, for regulatory agencies, but more importantly for our ag industries, which we're here to serve. Um, 
And again, you know, just to comment, this is this is sort of similar to to the trace forward conversation we had the other day, where uh, you have an emergency and you have to put staff onto it. This is similar to that when you have a have a new introduction in a state. Um, so just to kind of sum up here, uh, you know, we're going to continue working a little bit on our analysis. I wanted to bring this up at National Plant Board um, again you know, referring to the fact that there is a very long international border. This might be something that, that's of interest to other states. Um, certainly, I know it's of interest to USDA, and I hope, uh, you know, that, that states that are interested, as well as uh, folks at USDA who are interested in talking a little bit more about this in the future will, uh, will uh, reach out. So with that, I think that's really all I had to say. I appreciate uh, everybody listening. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so we're gonna switch it up a little bit. So we're gonna head up to the, the Southern Plant Board. Ansel, if you would like to, to get us started off, uh, feel free to start chatting or share your screen if you have anything you wanna share with us. Yeah, I don't have a screen or a presentation to share with the group, but I do want to uh, turn it over to two representatives from Southern Plant Board. Um, I'll start off with Mr. Joe Collins from Kentucky. Uh, to give us an update on Laura Wilk. Yeah, um, so am I able to share my screen? Give me just a second, Joe. I will make you a co-host. All right. This is going to be very short. Hands on our emailing back and forth, getting this prepared. Okay, you are now a co-host. You can you have that share screen option will be available to you at the bottom. All right, so um, should be able to see this uh, map. This is the most current uh, map of Laurel Wilt in the southeastern U.S. Um, Laura Wilt was first found in Savannah in 2002 and is found on, I think, Red Bay Ambrosia. Uh, it's spread by the Red Bay Ambrosia beetle. And, you know, I'm in a zone six state, so I didn't really pay too much attention to it. Uh, one of the pests, are, uh, it's a pest of avocado. Uh, the avocado industry in Kentucky is not, not doing too well, uh, a little bit too cold here. So, you know, I didn't really pay too much attention to it. Um, you know, the map gets, uh, keeps getting colored in, colored in, but still nothing close to us. Until 2019, um, it showed up in Western Kentucky and Western Tennessee. Uh, that area is uh, Fort Campbell uh, military base. Uh, it straddles the Kentucky-Tennessee line. It showed up there. And it's been in, uh, spotted in, in more places in Kentucky since then. It's um, uh, one, of the, one of the places is uh, actually in Louisville. So it's right on the, uh, you know, close to the Indiana border there. Um, funny thing is, is where we found it there is actually, um, I grew up in Louisville and it's about the way the crow flies a thousand feet from my house where I grew up there. So um, it is there. Um, it's, it's just showing up in more and more locations. It is on uh, sassafras is what, what they're seeing it on. Um, you know, for the nursery industry, you know, we haven't been paying too much attention to it, but uh, spice bush is also a plant that is, can be a host. So uh, we've had to, to learn a little bit more about that with our inspections and, and start to um, look for that in the nursery trade. So I'm just, uh, just very briefly, I just want to put this out there just kind of as an FYI to everybody um, to be looking in your, in your areas, uh, sassafras, um, look at those trees and um, just, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a regulatory concern, I don't think. Um, there's no quarantines for it right now. And it's really the, uh, the Kentucky Division of Forestry and I think other states of Division of Forestry are, are handling it as well. But I just want to make everybody aware of that. And that, that's all I have on this one. 
you might have any questions. So one question did come up. Um, is it limited by cold winters? I will say no. I, I'm not that familiar with it, but um, you know, our, our, our winters have not been what they normally, uh, what they were before, but um, it's, it, it gets cold. It's just not, not as cold. I mean, we're, you know, we're frequently below, um, below freezing. Um, it's not uncommon for us to have a, a short burst of below zero, but again, that's, you know, an insect can get, uh, can find protection for those. And of course, if they're born in a tree, they're going to be protected. Um, this is Faith Campbell, um, a professor at, Mich at uh, Mississippi State did a study of the insect, the vector insect, and it can survive uh, winter temperatures that would go up into Michigan. They're not quite so sure about the pathogen, but the vector can cover pretty much the whole range of sassafras. Yeah, and, and Scott Shermer just scared, shared as well that they have forecasters in Southern Illinois that are concerned about it as well. All right, Ansel, I've, I've done my part. Hey, thanks, Joe. Uh, if you don't mind, Jay, I'd like to turn it over to David over in Virginia. There's an update on spotted line of fly. Yep, absolutely. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. I don't have a presentation uh, at this moment, uh, but I will give a brief update on spotted lanternfly in Virginia. Uh, the population this year and last year uh, has increased a lot more than we have seen in the past, uh, going from uh, in 2019, where we had th uh, two counties. We had Frederick, which was under quarantine, and then we had just a very small amount of spotted lanternfly in Clark County, which was a neighboring county. 2020 to 2021 has seen a tremendous increase in isolated populations popping up along travel pathways, for instance, uh, rest areas. Uh, the railroad has been a tremendous mover in the last couple of years. So where we stand in 2021 is we have uh, expanded our quarantine which now includes Frederick County, City of Winchester, Clark and Warren County, which are the two neighboring counties. And we do have some significant populations which uh, we are going to be expanding our quarantine into several other counties. Um, some of those are not contiguous. They are a little farther away with one county being uh, two counties away. So ultimately it's moving along the railroad and we're running into roadblocks with railroads trying to work with them for access and for treatments. So uh, that's an ongoing problem that we are trying to address working with railroads and working with counties to, you know, get in there um, and respond rapidly. Uh, I would say we have had two situations where we responded quickly. Um, one was a find of several adults, or sorry, several fourth star, fourth instar nymphs on some sticky bands and in a circle trap. That was found at a rest area. Uh, we kind of panicked and had a very quick response with USDA bringing in a bifenthrin spray truck. Uh, we did extensive surveys and massive egg mass scrapings uh, and surveys. So that site, we've been back multiple times. That find was in the middle of 2020, so the summer of 2020. We've been back several times since and no evidence of spotted lanternfly at that site. So it was a very quick response within a week. And we feel very comfortable after doing surveys that we eradicated that population. However, uh, in the other situations where we have found it um, along either railroads um, or you know at a, at a new population site, uh, by the time we get there, if we don't respond as quickly, um, most of the time it's it's too big of a population. Or upon surveys, we have found that it's been there for more than a year, more than a season. So. Um, we're struggling to really kind of 
reallocate our resources because it's spreading at a rate that now we're having to prioritize where can we do treatments, where should we be doing treatments, should we be focusing on the generally infested area, um, or should we be focusing, focusing on these isolated populations. So um, I actually do have, I wonder if I might be able to share my screen. Um, Jay, I do have one thing popped up that I would share with everyone if I could get that ability. Okay, you should be good to go, David. Thank you. So what we developed is this is just a really brief um, just image. We developed this priority matrix in consultation with USDA to make sure that we were prioritizing our treatments. Uh, we developed this priority matrix where we could look at what's the risk of the transportation for this site. Um, is it connected to the generally infested area? Is it a high population? Is it a reproducing population? And is this a new county fine? So this was just something that we came up with real quick to say, um, you know, man, this is getting very difficult to manage and we have to figure out how to prioritize it. So um, by answering those questions, you can assign the priority of that site, uh, either a three or two or a one. One being a high priority, that's the one that you really wanna get to uh, and respond rapidly and have the most impact in reducing the spread. So. That's just something that we have, uh, that was the end of 20, no, yeah, end of 2019. And we've been working with this kind of decision matrix since that time. So um, other than that, we do have plans to uh, further expand our quarantine. Uh, we do have several counties where our activities are not eradicating those populations. Um, in others, we are working real hard to try and uh, get in there and treat as heavily and as within the environmental assessment as possible to reduce those populations. Another challenge that we run into with spotted lantern flight in at least in Virginia is we're having some uh, communication and outreach. It, we're telling people about spotted lantern fly and we're just working to develop and can continue to finesse the communications where we're not promising that every property is going to receive treatment, that it's all you know based on resources that we need to get community involvement and engagement as well. And as Dana mentioned, putting out outreach and, and figuring out the best way that we can assign our resources for those outreach. So, you know, do we put up billboards or do we put them in rest areas? Um, you know, one of the things that we did was instead of putting it in these travel centers because people couldn't go in, they were closed, um, but people were going to state parks when they were still open. And when they began opening back up, we would place uh, these banners in there. So when they're out and they're traveling and they're, you know, we kind of had to shift our mindset as how do we get um, the best outreach and the best bang for our buck by targeting where people were going. So that's an ongoing and evolving process. So yeah, spider lantern fly is a big challenge. It's a big resource drain, big time drain. Um, but again, we're still trying to do everything that we can to prevent it spread and rapidly responding to sites um, having a toolkit ready to go is the biggest thing. Having treatment options, uh, those are really important pieces. And of course, access early on. So Ansel, that's all I had. Really wish I had a presentation, but uh, I think that's all I got. I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time for that. Thanks, Dave. Jay, I believe that's all from Southern Plant Board. Okay, not a problem at all. So we do want to go ahead and open it up. I did send out a message in chat, but um, any of the plant boards, so we haven't heard from Western or Central yet. Um, if you guys would like to speak up or anyone at all, if you have anything you would like to talk about, uh, feel free to bring that up now. Um, you can either hop on right now or send me a message and let me know if you need me to make a co-host so you can share your screen. David, a question did come up in the meantime about uh, a question about what was in the toolkit for spotted lantern fly. Yeah, I was going to respond, that, but I'm glad. Thanks for bringing me into that one. So um, great question. Uh, some of the things that I mentioned uh, or I didn't really touch on or describe, but in a toolkit would be, uh, for instance, having availability to like, let's say you're responding to someone reporting. 
uh, if you're going to go out and you might find spotted lanternfly, you want to be able to have either some traps ready to go, whether that be circle traps or sticky bands um, or the bug barrier. Those are all your options. But you want to be able to go there and respond to what you see. So the worst thing that you could do is go there, survey, come back later, because by that time they could have moved on. So um, having availability for staff to either apply pesticides like bifenthrin or a dinotefrin bark spray, having the backpacks to do that. Um, one of the things that we're working with right now is doing injector kits to treat tree of heaven. So that's a um, you know tree injector kit where you can apply pesticides within the EA and the label requirements to get some nice long lasting um, treatment options for those trees. Scrapers, you know, binoculars, you basically want to be able to go and um, be ready to handle that situation as you see it. Also getting um, permission forms or access forms. We have a uh, signature form where a business or a citizen would sign to give permission for us to do those treatments. So having that with you there ready to go um, is all of that is kind of part of the toolkit that I was referencing. Oh, David, this is Faith. Um, when you say pesticides for Atlantis, you're talking about pesticides to kill the insect that's on the Atlantis. You're, are you killing the Atlantis? Yeah, good question, Faith. So part of that program early on was managing tree of heaven, uh, smaller stemmed tree of heaven. Um, and so that was using herbicides. And we've kind of shifted focus to making sure that we're treating the trees, um, the removing for, for a spy lantern fly. So treating them with the herbicide was not uh, proving to be effective at controlling the spread of spy lantern fly. Now, granted, if you're in a location where you can't apply, so some of the restrictions in the EA, like wetlands, prevent some of the use of some of those, either contact insecticides or systemics. So um, you could use an herbicide to kill tree of heaven in that case. Um, but uh, what I'm more referring to is getting out there and trying to treat the spotted lantern fly, um, whether that's using dinocide or, you know, dinotefurin um, or bifenthrin, contact insecticide. Uh, well, that's fine, but I'm a little concerned that some people may not know that you can't kill Atlantis by cutting it down. You end up with sure. dog, dog hair root sprouts. So if right. they're trying to get rid of Atlantis, they got to herbicide it. Right. And, and most of the recommendations that we have for treatments, we have a, a good handout that came with um, uh, Virginia Department of Forestry. That's what we give our landowners and um, most of the people that are doing the treatments for the herbicides are following the recommendations of using herbicides to kill the tree heaven and then also making sure that those sprouts those re-sprouting trees are managed appropriately as well awesome thank you very much david um okay we're going to switch over to the central plant board um so dan if you would like to hop on you can go ahead and uh, introduce your folks or if they just want to hop on um, if anyone needs presentations shared, let me know and I'll make them a co-host. Great. Yeah, Jay, thanks. Um, I think I was going to share just a, a map or Google Maps here. Um, and uh, we don't have much uh, in Central um, other than uh, just wanted to, to update everybody on the location of, of the newly discovered SLF in Ohio and then most recently in Indiana. Um, and then uh, I think Scott would like to uh, just kind of go through a little case study of, of uh, giant African land snail that happened in Illinois. Um, so we'll be, we'll be brief. Um, yep. You should be able to share now if you want. Okay. Okay, great. Can, is, is that working? Yep, looks great. Okay, cool. Um, so just wanted to orient everyone um, with uh, the, the infestation that we found in Ohio uh, last um, October, I believe it was, um, in a town called Bingo Junction. Um, and uh, I think it's you know probably not a, not a unique story, uh, but um, just kind of give you the, the lay of the land there. Um, it's, it's really kind of, um, right in, in, in the area, the kind of an area that you would expect. And it's, we've got rail lines coming through here. 
Um, and then a lot of the barge traffic here. And this is an old steel mill um, in in the uh, uh, right along the Ohio River. Um, and then this would be the Panhandle of West Virginia here. Um, and as I zoom out, I just wanted to show you kind of, and I think Megan will talk a little bit more about the the find and um, hope I'm not making anybody motion sick here um, in Indiana, but um, it's also along the Ohio River. Um, not sure if there's any correlation there, but here's Pittsburgh, and just to kind of give you give you an idea where we're where we're at there. Um, in Ohio, we uh, um, did some as much survey as we could over the winter, um, and uh, and we have conducted a couple of treatments in this area already. We've been working with um, the Science and Technology Group at, with APHIS, um, and uh, um, they were gracious to loan us some equipment to uh, to do some uh, treatments. Uh, using a mist blower uh, under the the um, kind of a, an experimental EA that we're working with uh, to to test out some of the effectiveness of of these new methods treatment methods. So um, appreciate the help um, from from Matt uh, Travis and 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 John Birch's group here in Ohio. Um, other than that, we're just going to continue to follow the playbook and and take lessons from our uh, neighboring states and and. Uh, um, keep moving ahead with the program. Um, I really don't have any anything else that's Ohio specific, other than I just wanted to to share um, uh, a little shot of our our website um, and kind of touch on um, let's see if that switch happened. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, just try to, to touch on um, something that we've we've done in the past, but has, has really um, been a great tool setting up these kind of online reporting forms um, using some existing Esri software that we already have. Um, it's really helped cut down on phone calls um, and, and really gives us a little bit more uh, to work with in terms of information uh, by using the online reporting tools. We used it for, um, we, we first set it up, I think, for the mystery seed issue, um, and then uh, subsequently set it up for the uh, H giant hornet um, and, and spotted lanternfly as well. Um, just a plug for that kind of concept. I know in a lot of other states are doing that, but thought I'd just toss that out to a bigger audience. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Megan, are you on? Or? Yeah, I'm here. Um, that I'll pass it over to Megan. Okay. Can I share my screen, guys? Go ahead, Megan. I just made you a co-host. So you should have okay. that share screen option available. Here we go. All right, you should be able to see my map here. Is that what you're seeing? Yep. Correct. Looks okay, great. so this is the woodlot that we found um, spotted lantern fly in Indiana. In, and this came in a homeowner of this property was um, drinking coffee on his porch, looked at his walnut tree, which is in this corner here. And there was a spotted lantern fly nymph um, climbing up and down it. He sent a picture in to our um, email address, um, our general division email, um, saying, hey, isn't this that bug that you guys are looking for? So I sent our inspector there the next day, uh, and he went to go and look for it and couldn't see anything. The homeowner came home while he was there, and they went for a walk in the woods back here, um, and there is evidence of an infestation that's been there a few years now. So this property is owned by three people. Um, there's a gentleman that lives here, the guy that called in, and this gentleman that is from Pennsylvania. They moved there three years ago. They like to um, uh, go to dog shows on the weekends in their RVs and then have people come to their place uh, to do dog shows as well. So they've got four dog shows planned this summer at their property with people that plan on spending the night in their RVs outside of it um, from the surrounding states. So we're going to have to figure out how to manage that. 
Um, right now, we plan on going in and doing uh, chemical treatments as soon as we can get the equipment here. Um, as far as we can tell at this point, we did do a, a survey of the surrounding area. Um, as you can see it's really close to the border here. <clears throat> Kentucky, it's right across the way. And this is the wood lot then that's got the infestation in it. We did do some surveying in the surrounding areas. We canvassed as much as we could with homeowners. Um, but only a few miles away, of course, is uh, um, uh, the dam that you can get across the, the, the river on. Um, there's a casino over here. There's a golf course right here. Um, and then there's several RV parks right here that these people um, will drive in, stay in their RV for a few months and work at one of these steel mills and then go back to where they came from. So we're very interested in making sure that this infestation stays in this woodlot right here and that we eradicate it as well as we can. Um, our only issues at this point is that it's contiguous forest and land, but also it's very shrubby and scrubby back there. So we're gonna have a heck of a time trying to get in there to try and do the treatments, um, let alone make sure that we've got them all. So we'll be working on that. Um, we've got a goal six um, survey application put in um, to do some more mitigation in the area. So we're hoping that comes through. In the meantime, we'll be using some more state funds to um, try and eradicate what we can. Any questions? So Samantha Simon, you have your hand up if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, hi, Megan. Um, hey, I was wondering, is there any Elanthus in that area? There is. Uh, that's How where much? we found those um, insects. They were There were several um, Elanthus in the woodlot back there, um, as well as along the tree line, and they were perched right on them. Uh, there was enough of, of them the spotted lantern fly to have already created in a uh, city mold and it seemed to be raining down on them while they were in there in the oh, wood line. Right. So all right. Thanks, Megan. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Megan. Um, Dan, we're gonna go back to you for just a second. We had a question regarding uh spotted lantern fly reports. And as to who actually polishes up on those reports for you in your state? Yeah, we have um, um, kind of a lead in our in our division that um, is kind of a GIS uh, wizard, and and he uh, he'll he'll monitor the all of our reporting sites, and then and then farms them out to our um, whoever's the lead on the, on the the particular pest or issue. So either our, our, some of our lab techs or our particular inspectors or managers that we have on staff. Perfect, thank you very much. And then Jay, and I think I we had, said... yeah, we'd have uh, one other topic to touch on. Um, Scott just wanted to kind of go over a little experience, experience in, in Illinois with, uh, with snails. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I was hoping you were going to call it an update because that would indicate that something was ongoing here, but it's more of a um, uh, an incident uh, anecdote, I guess. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that watching the trend of SLF, uh, I don't have to report on that just yet, going from Ohio to Indiana and, and covering the river. Uh, it, it seems like uh, all indications say that we should be next, but um, I uh, wanted to touch on uh, uh, a giant African land snail incident, and I'm going to kind of cover this on the fly because I think it's kind of a, a neat story to tie into what Nicole was talking about earlier on. And then some of the questions that came up regarding e-commerce and, and monitoring um, um, online activities and things like that. So I was approached uh, about facilitating in, uh, an investigation regarding a, a, a private uh, home or residence that was involved in some uh, giant land, giant African land snail 
uh, activity. Um, and and the, the real purpose of it was to kind of facilitate access and, and communications on, on a local level to, to gain access to the property and, and look into um, um, the presence of the snails. Um, so working with, uh, with the Department of Agriculture here and then uh, me reaching out to, to DNR or, or facilitating those contacts and getting a, uh, um, a conservation police officer on site along with local police um, because it was a, a relatively complicated situation um, from, a, from a personal and um, I'll call it a clientele level. Um, but long story short, we went, we were able to get up there, we were able to, to search the premise and, and we found nothing, which was, which was quite disheartening. And, and I don't know if Trevor's on here or anybody else that's dealt with, uh, with galls, but uh, it certainly led to some jokes about, uh, I guess they S car got away and, and how'd you let them slip away and things like that. But anyway, um, the most interesting thing I think was that be, just because we didn't find anything or didn't find any evidence on site um, didn't mean that, that it was basically throw your hands up and, and investigation over. And, and this is kind of where I'm, I'm going to tie things into to Nicole's presentation and, and some of those questions is that um, the, the online activity and the postings and the, the purchase records um, were, were probably one of the strongest um, bits of evidence. So um, you know, if you're ever involved in, in these kinds of situations, I guess the take home message is don't, don't get disheartened, do what you can, try and help what you can, um, you know, use your trained eyes, use your, use, use your um, inspectors and your resources to try and find what you, <laughs> thanks, David, I appreciate that, that that's a new one, um, but, um, you know, there, there's other stuff out there that can that can certainly be, um, I'll use the term damning when it comes to a situation like this. So, you know, I think we were all, uh, and when I say we, my, myself and the CITSI officer that went up there to kind of conduct the inspection, um, you know, we were, we were really expecting to find something based on what we had heard and the evidence that was presented to us um, to kind of justify going up there to begin with. Uh, we thought we were going to find hundreds of snails in, in terrariums, but uh, finding nothing, it was it was really um, disheartening. And, and then you start to think, where did they go? What happened to them? Did they get sold? Did they get further distributed? So, um, you know, again, a take home message on this is, is that there's more evidence than just what you can get in hand. Um, you know, the way that the world is working these days and, and the access that the investigators have to online records um, certainly is, uh, is, is impressive and, um, and can, um, can probably ultimately lead to enforcement action just, to, just as good as, as maybe having a, a snail in hand. So uh, with that, I will, uh, I will conclude. Sorry, I didn't have any, uh, any photos or anything, but uh, if I did find one, I'm, I'm sure I would have had pictures, but I would have been creeped out touching it, so I'll admit that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Scott. Sure. That's, That's it for you. special, Jay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, it was a great update. Uh, I will take a brief moment, and uh, I feel like I should plug my part of the program as well for Spotted Lanternfly. So um, just really quick, we did do the Spotted Lanternfly 101 and the Spotted Lanternfly Summit in February of this year. Um, we did go into a lot of information about following up on reports, all that kind of stuff. So that's all available on our stopslf.org website, which um, I'm going to go ahead and post into the chat if you haven't seen it. Um, and with that, I will stop my terrible plug and we'll get back to, to this discussion. So um, anyone else would like to share? We still haven't heard from Western. If you guys would like to bring anything up. Hi, Jay. This is Mia. Um, Helmuth was unable to attend today, um, is my understanding. And um, I don't believe Ian is on as our VP. So um, Jake um, Bodart might present some information and update on Japanese beetle. Thanks, Mia. Um, so for Japanese beetle in the West, uh, in Oregon this year, we treated our treatment area of around uh, 4,000, what is it? 4,325 acres. Uh, and then we had a little bit of spread of Japanese beetle over into 
a new area. Thankfully, we did a granular and foliar treatment in that area as well. Um, and if anyone wants to look at our treatment map, it's on JapaneseBeetlePDX.com. Um, last year, we trapped around 4,490 beetles in the area, and we went down around 42% uh, from trap catches from previous year. In Washington, uh, they found Japanese beetle over in Grandview. I believe their estimated area that they're looking at for treatment is around 20,480 acres in that area. And California uh, this year already treated as well in their location near Ranchero and Cordova. Uh, and they also treated a major golf course nearby. And then uh, if anyone has any additional, okay. yep. So Annie, a good question. Uh, we treated with Accelifrin G uh, and that's the same product that was used in California. And then we used Accelifrin as a foliar. So it's the same product. And if you need more updates, feel free to reach out on Japanese Beetle in those areas. And then Mia, I do have a quick update on Gypsy Moth if we have time. I believe so. Jay, we're good on time, right? Yep, absolutely. Go ahead, Jake. Okay. And for Lamantria Dispar, um, I'm just going to go by European or Asian for those species. Last year in Oregon, we detected one European and one Asian on the border uh, along the Columbia Gorge. And then across from our detection of Asian gypsy moth in that same area, uh, Washington also detected an AGM. Uh, they were both determined to be separate introductions with different genetics on those. And then uh, this year so far, this week, uh, we found our first suspect over in a different part along the Columbia River near Walla Walla. And that sample was sent off uh, this week to Otis for final confirmation and genetics. And that is, again, along the Columbia River. So we're curious to see what more we'll find in that area. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Um, I, I did see a few others on from um, the West. I didn't know if anyone else wanted to add anything to that or add, um, add to this discussion. Let's see, responses. So I think we're good. All right, well, thank you both to Jake and Mia. Um, so we've got just a few minutes left. Um, we'll go ahead and open it up. Are there any other questions that came up for our presenters, for our discussions here, uh, you know, during the, the hot topics from the regions? Is there anything else anyone would like to discuss before we wrap up the meeting? Jay, this is David from Virginia. If, if um, I know I put a picture up of that uh, priority matrix tool. So if anybody wants that, I, I'd be happy to share it. I've got it in a PDF form or a P, uh, uh, PowerPoint form, so it's editable. Um, yeah, just let me know and I'd be happy to share it with, with anybody. Awesome, thank you, David. We'll give it one more moment. We'll go ahead and put Julie on notice that we're we're coming to the close here. If she's ready to go, but again, if you have any other questions for any of our folks out here, please let us know.